ونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفرهونسفر
it was not just Arabs but non-Arabs had settled in Muslim lands and there was this language barrier the Arabs could not speak their language and the non-Arabs could not communicate with the Tabi'een or even for that matter with the few companions that were there in the Arabic language so there was no quick solution and this was an enormous challenge for Hazrat Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala and remember we did not have technology at that time today you phone someone, you email someone everything is very very fast but during the time of Rasulullah, during the time of the Khulafai Rashidin, no technology at all in fact just to simplify the understanding of how difficult it must be for Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, let us compare Leicester anybody who settles in Leicester alhamdulillah they have nothing but good to say about Leicester alhamdulillah they would say that in Leicester we have a lot of masajid we have madaris we have makatib marakiz a lot of Islamic activities we have uh, alhamdulillah a proper madrasa system we have a Darul Ulum we have Islamic schools we have a strong Muslim community we have businesses we have a good mix in Leicester and Islam is strong in Leicester generally that is why you will find a lot of people want to settle in Leicester but if you were just to go out a few miles just a few miles out of Leicester there is this complete different picture that you will see in Leicester Alhamdulillah uh, the mahal, the people, the community the setting of the Muslims is different but just a few miles out of Leicester a sizable Muslim community but you might not even have a masjid there and they might be praying in a musalla some place of worship you might not even have a proper setup of the madrasa there you might not even have a hivs class there you might not even have a proper imam to lead the Muslim community to prayers just a few miles away from Leicester now this is our condition we live in a comfort zone we have the technology we have everything but yet we see the difference between cities and other areas that are just outside the city of Leicester now imagine how difficult it must have been for Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala the Persians come with their own culture the Romans come with their own culture and people from Africa come with their own culture the Byzantine come with their own culture different people from different areas come with their own culture and they have their own problems and they come with their own problems and settle in Muslim lands so this was the challenge the most difficult situation for Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, which also contributes to the fitna and the turmoil that started during his term of Khilafat the second difficulty of Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, was the emergence of a new generation you now had during the life of Sayyidina Usman radiallahu ta'ala a new generation that was growing up and the youth wanted a position in the community and the youth were very different to the first generation the first generation of people were distinguished by the taqwa sahabai kiram ajma'in and the tabi'in they were distinguished by the link and connection with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam they were pious people but the second generation that grew up they were very different why a lot of dunya there was a lot of greed there was a lot of wealth wealth started pouring in during the term of Khilafat of Sayyidina Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala they wanted position they did not just want the Arabs to rule but now non-Arabs wanted to come into power and this was a great difficulty for Sayyidina Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala Allama ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi what a great scholar of this ummah sums it up very beautifully he said that there was no difficulty for Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala why? the message was very clear for the people 
Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said to the people, Iktadu billadaini min ba'di Abu Bakrin wa Umar. That after me, follow the guidance of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala. A simple message. After me, follow Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. So there was no difficulty. Majority of the people that were there were Arabs, Arab speaking, Arabic speaking people. And everything was under control during the time of Rasulullah, during the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr, and during the time of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. But during the Khilafat of Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala, the Muslims were influenced by outside culture. They were influenced by outside culture and also greed, selfishness, individualism. They wanted everything for themselves. That is the picture that Islamic history gives us during the Khilafat of Sayyidina Usman bin Affan and during the time of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala. And remember, a lot of the companions had passed away during the time of Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala. And the people around did not stay in the company of the few sahaba kiram ajma'een that were there. So it was everything what they would see and information that they have just taken, that was the difficulty. In fact, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, during his khilafat, uh, a man spoke to him very arrogantly. And you can just see the condition of the hearts changing. He said to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, why is it that people deferred concerning you? Why did people differ concerning you? And they did not differ concerning the status of Hazrat Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Why is it that they readily were prepared to accept Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar, but people had different opinions about yourself? And what a beautiful answer Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala gives. He says that because when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma were rulers, they were rulers over people like myself and my brother Uthman. They were rulers over people like myself and my brother Uthman. Now we are rulers over people like yourselves. <laughs> now we are rulers over people like you. And that is the difficulty. And people change. Allahu Akbar. It doesn't take long for a person to change my respected brothers. Things can change very, very quickly. And this was the difficulty of Sayyidina Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala. An, and why I am thoroughly explaining this to you, my respected brothers, so that we must make sure we have respect of this great Sahabi whose name is Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala. An. And we must... Always hold this great Sahabi in high esteem. And now just to explain how fitna, turmoil started. It wasn't just one particular group, different groups of people, different pockets of people. For an example, from the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Khilafat of Hazrat Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala, they were people who had violated the laws of the Quran and the Khilafat must have punished them by banishing them out of the capital city, Madinatul Munawwara. And the rule was that you can't settle in a Muslim city. You have to be close to the borders of the Arabian Peninsula and move out. So this was a punishment. And so there was one entire group of people that were banished from the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, and Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an. So this group of people also reunited and formed an alliance and wanted to challenge the seat of leadership in Madinatul Munawwara. One group of people. The second group of people were the desert Bedouins. Strong-hearted, stone-hearted people. These people can be described as the wolves of the Arabs. The ruffians, the wolves of the Arabs. For them it was just greed. For them it was just greed. And these were people who were not associated 
with the companions, let alone Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are now into the time of Hazrat Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an. What they wanted to do was to divide the companions. Especially Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Talha, Hazrat Zubair radiallahu ta'ala an, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and the companions. And they started using the most powerful tool of the shaitan. Which is the most powerful tool of the shaitan? To spread false, okay, to spread false rumors, to spread lies, and to accuse people. This was the game that was being played. They started lying. And fitna in a community starts like that. When you start lying, false propaganda. And this is fitna. Isn't this a fitna for the Muslims? That Muslims are portrayed as terrorists. That's a fitna. False allegations. It's a fitna. And so this is what they started doing. Fitna, creating fitna, difficulty for the seat of leadership in Madinatul Munawwara, which were the Qurayshi people and the Arabs. Subhanallah. And they tried to create this divide between the Arabs and the non-Arabs. This was the difficulty. And so they first wanted to play with the minds of Sahabai Kiram Ajma'een. Especially Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, subhanallah. And they even forged letters, fabricating uh, different uh, letters, ahadith, and attributing them to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and attributing them to the companions. That this letter was written by Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, and this is the messenger that brought the letter and look at it Hazrat Usman has no respect for us and everything was a lie everything was fabricated, forged rather they started playing this game of Allahu Akbar spreading lies and spreading false rumors it was extremely difficult one group which we have to make sure that we have a good understanding of is a sect, a group which is known as the Sabai group. What group is that? The Sabai group. Now this is not uh, an imagination or a figment of imagination. Why I am saying this? Because modern day Shias say that there is no such thing as the Sabai group to suit their purpose. Modern day Shia says that there is no Sabai group. We have to make sure that we understand this historically it is proven that there was this group during the Khilafat of Sayyidina Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an, and the name that was given to them Sabai group was from a man whose name was Abdullah ibn Sabah what was his name? Abdullah ibn Sabah this man was a very powerful man he was a Yemeni Jewish man he was from Yemen but a Jewish man. Remember, the Jewish people had settled in the Arabian Peninsula close to Madinatul Munawwara, even in Yemen, anticipating the coming of the last prophet, hoping that the last prophet will be a Jew from amongst them. But because the last Nabi was from the Arabs, they did not want to accept Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so you also had a lot of Jewish people settled in Yemen. So this man was a Yemeni Jew who pretended to have embraced Islam. He was a munafiq. But a munafiq as such that when you look at him, you would be deceived. Inwardly he was different and outwardly he was different. Outwardly he pretended to be a great sheikh, a very pious man. And in fact, he would actually influence the people around him. He would actually do that. This was the power that he had, Abdullah ibn Sabah. And he engineered and he was the main man who came up with this master plan, how to topple the leadership in Madinatul Munawwara. For that, you need to have a lot of uh, uh, good understanding, making sure that you have the right propaganda tools available. It, it was never going to be easy for this man. And so what he started professing is that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, Hazrat Osman are in the wrong. 
What did he say? The three are in the wrong. The two have passed away, but Hazrat Usman is in the wrong. Leadership and Khilafat should have been given to Hazrat Ali. And what he started saying, he started quoting hadith, which were all wrong, fabricated hadith. And he would say to the people, I heard this from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he would actually make up chain of narrators and attribute it to a sahabi and then attribute it to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so you had in Kufa, in Basra, in Egypt, different groups of people who did not speak Arabic. But when you say to them that this is the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they were prepared to accept that message. And what he actually said to the people is that it is rewarding for people to fight against the people of Medina because it was wrong for them to allow Hazrat Osman to be the Khalifa. And so now just imagine my respected brothers, Allahu Akbar, he actually formed up groups of people starting from Egypt, from Kufa, from Basra, inviting people to fight and he's saying that if you fight it is rewarding for you. Why? Because you are fighting for the sake of truth. And you are fighting for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah. And these are the words of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I put the ahadith in front of you. So many chain of narrators, hadith coming from different, different sources. All fabricated, all wrong ahadith, all mawzu'at. But yet he influenced the people. And this is what the shaitan did. Shaitan inwardly was different. Outwardly he pretended to be a great abid. Shaitan worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to such an extent that even the angels started respecting him. But what was inside was something else. The seeds of pride and arrogance were inside him. And that is why at the critical juncture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him mardud. And made him shaitan, the one who is the accursed one. And similarly... The same example can be given about this man whose name is Abdullah ibn Sabah. Outwardly he was very different. But inside he was a munafiq. And until today, the Shia regime, the modern day Shia regime, is actually connected all the way to Abdullah ibn Sabah, who was a, a Jewish man. And this was the works of the Jewish people to dismantle the strength and the unity of the Muslims. Until today, my respected brothers, and we need to understand this, and we have to be open about this, so at least we understand our history, and we understand why we are Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'at. So this was a, a problem that Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an was facing. Already a group of people came to Medina tul Munawwara. Hazrat Usman was shocked, and they said, why are you here? And they said that, oh, we are here because we were invited by the companions of Rasulullah. And this was also a lie. Hazrat Usman said, who invited you to Medina to Munawwara? And they said, so and so, so and so person invited us to Medina to Munawwara, which was again all lies. And when they got to Medina to Munawwara, they demanded. They said to Hazrat Usman, we want you to remove uh, the governors. And after removing the governors, we also want to remove you from your position. That we don't accept you as a Khalifa. And they started uh, intimidating the people of Medina Tul Munawwara and challenging also Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an, that we, we are not scared and if it needs to even uh, physically push you out, from the city of Medina to Munawwara and even if it means to assassinate you or to murder you we are prepared to do that al yazubillah this is what they said to hadrat Osman bin Affan radiyallahu ta'ala an from this group this group is known as the Sabai group now one very important lesson for us to learn my respected brothers when we talk about history we must also take in uh, important lessons for us to learn that is why it is very important that when a person takes the path of suluk or 
he wants to be a pious man if he wants to be very pious then with piety comes knowledge with piety comes knowledge a person needs the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah to be the foundation and only then that person can be a true muttaqi person if you don't have knowledge shaitan can easily mislead you knowledge is very very important that is why the very first verse revealed to rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam iqra what is iqra knowledge take in quran iqra read the quran knowledge is important without knowledge the shaitan can mislead you and even today in the modern society you will see such people who i describe as ignorant piety what is it ignorant piety and rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very very careful to take control of this for an example one sahabi came to rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said ya rasul allah i will not marry i will not marry is there anyone here who has this desire not to marry mushtaq eh? mushtaq married mashallah is done justice to this ummah alhamdulillah ji is there anyone here no good alhamdulillah i see you'll find some women saying oh mali sahab you talk about eight children but who'll do their tarbiya wow who'll do their tarbiya let, let me just answer to my mothers and sisters when we talk about eight children a father who has one child if he has the fear of allah he will make the tarbiya of that one child also if the same father has got 10 children he will also do the tarbiya of 10 children whether you have one child two children three children four children or five or whatever when the man is in the right mindset and he wants the children to be pious he will work for his children and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help that individual we need to look at the wider picture the benefits and inshallah ta'ala it doesn't take long for a person to change who knows you've seen people who have been evil all their life but all of a sudden they change all of a sudden they change so this sahabi said i will not marry rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam got very angry and he said an nikahu min sunnati nikah is my sunnah who is more obedient to allah than myself than rasulullah and he said i worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i have also married and i have children and i have taken that responsibility and in anger rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said faman raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni and he said this only for nikah that if you turn away from my sunnah of nikah then you are not from me allahu akbar my respected brothers and you see allah's nabi was very very careful so you sometimes you'll find people to wear a scarf over their heads and to wear a turban mashallah pagri and mashallah they are pious it's good but with piety you need you need knowledge sit in the majalis of the scholars and take in knowledge knowledge helps an individual is it not that when uh, uh, it, it, they speak about sheikh abdul qadir jilani rahmatullah alay that a jinn came to him from uh, in his room and the jinn spoke to him and said uh, sheikh abdul qadir jilani you are such a pious man such a pious man that you now no longer need to perform your prayers now you don't need to perform your prayers and sheikh abdul qadir jilani said a'udhu billahi min ash shaitanir rajim you are shaitan you are a shaitan and so this jinn said your knowledge has saved you what did the jinn say your knowledge has saved you sheikh abdul qadir jilani said no no my allah has saved me my allah has saved me you need knowledge my respected brothers knowledge is very very important allahu akbar now just to give you some examples you'll find certain individuals in the modern society that we live in and i'll use uh, the indian terminology we say peers what do we say 
peers of shuyukh now don't get me wrong i'm not against peers they are mashallah very very pious people there's nothing wrong with that but certain categories of peers are such that they conveniently uh, take concession in the laws of sharia to their advantage for an example you'll find some peers who will casually speak and speak to a woman and this rule of parda it is as if though it is not for them but it is for the rest of the world and you'll find silly men also allowing their wives ha ha sheikh sahab aaye peer sahab aaye go and the picture that this peer gives is that i have reached this extraordinary level of taqwa that this uh, carnal desire or this urge shahwa has been completely relinquished or terminated from me and therefore this this ruling of parda does not exist anymore for me and so a woman can come and i can touch her because i'm touching her without shahwat who's there to guarantee i'm touching that woman without shahwat and people actually accept that and this is ignorant piety this is ignorant piety because that man himself hasn't got knowledge but he just wants to take advantage of society of a community by portraying himself to be a very pious man so we have to be very very careful wallahi somebody had sent me an email of this ismaili sect of the is name you got to see the ismaili sect i'm not sure who sent me that and there is uh, i showed it to ari bhai ari bhai we saw it in the office and there is this ismaili scholar and there is a queue of women women are coming and he's actually kissing the feet or or the foot sometimes both sometimes just you know one foot and kissing it and he's embracing the women and all that and for them there is nothing wrong they say that this is jaiz because he has reached this extraordinary level of taqwa that's why you'll find some people they say we don't need to pray namaz in the masjid our ruh performs salah elsewhere and this is ignorant piety and that is what happened with this group of abdullah ibn saba they were fouling their mouth and they were prepared to say that we can actually do, do jihad with the people of madina why because we are siding with hazrat ali this is how the shaitan deceived them allahu akbar you'll find some people some sufis actually allowing their murids to dance and this goes on in syria a lot and there is a dancing you know arena and they dance from one side to another and they fall in this mode of trance and they dance and they chant the name of allah and they spin and spin at times they even uh, use musical instruments and the shaitan deceives them this is ignorant piety and they say that because we are taking the name of allah and his rasul dama dam mast kalandar ali ka naam sabse pehla i don't know how it goes wallah walam but something to the effect and this is it and they will play musical instruments and they will go around and they will issue fatwas and you'll find the juhala streaming with them and enjoying and if you try to say by this is wrong ha taliban aa gaya what will they say taliban aa gaya allah ignorant piety and you'll find that you know at times you're invited to a nikah mauli sahab mashallah pray the quran and you have a hafiz sahab he'll read the quran and nazam and mashallah the nikah bayan and everything is done and nikah bhai tumne accept kiya kiya ha na kiya the duas are all done immediately within one hour bollywood songs can you imagine immediately after one hour and nowadays they even hire uh, women and what is it belly dancing belly dancing takes takes place in uh, muslim weddings really belly dancing takes place ignorant piety disrespecting the quran and the sunna of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam so things change very quickly my respected brothers alhamdulillah allah has blessed us with knowledge in fact one jamaat tablig group went to poland and they were they, even in poland in some area there are a sizable 
there is a sizable community of Muslims that are living there. And Mahmoud Bai was telling me that because they are busy on a Friday, they've decided to pray their Jummah Salah on a Sunday. <laughs> because they are busy on a Friday. Do you want to do something like that by here? Huh? Because they are busy on a Friday, they have actually, they, they have actually changed the days and they have the, the main day, Yawmul Jumu'ah, to be on a Sunday. How far is Poland from England? It's in Europe. But see the difference, my respected brothers and elders. So we have to be very, very careful and we, we have to adhere to the teachings of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'at. And Alhamdulillah, we need to understand Islamic history in its in its purity and in the in the way shown to us by salafu salihin that is very very important allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana muhammadin nabiyyil ummi wa ala alihi wa sallim taslima allahumma taqabbal minna wa tub alayna innaka antat tawwabur rahim nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk sami'na wa atana ghufranaka rabbana wa ilayk al-maseer bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin